It's been a busy week on both the national and local political scenes. On Tuesday, Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, picked California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. Harris is the first black candidate to be nominated for vice president by a major political party. And in another major political development in the first congressional district, allegations surfaced last week of candidate Alex Morse's relationships with college students while he was an adjunct professor at UMass. Now, joining me in the studio to discuss the selection of Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's running mate and the latest in the Richard Neal Alex Morse race for Congress are political consultants Tony Signoli and Ryan McCollum. Uh, last time we were on, I was talking about the turnout in urban areas and in battleground states. So the, the places like Philadelphia and Milwaukee and Detroit, where Hillary didn't do as well as uh, President Obama did in um, 12 and in 08. And um, I think uh, Kamala proved, she, one thing she proved is that she can rally big crowds. Her announcement was a huge announcement early on and, and people thought that she had a lot of momentum. Um, I can see her doing similar things in those cities that I just pre previously spoke about, which will help in those battleground states. And Tony, do you feel that Joe Biden made the best choice for vice president in Kamala Harris? And what do you feel uh, this will do for his chances of defeating President Trump in November? I think this was the best choice. We looked at all the different particulars that you have to choose a vice presidential uh, running mate on. She's got the charisma. She's got the ability. She's super sharp. She can campaign hard. You really can't judge her by her performance in this presidential race. You've got to look at the hard races she's had in places like California. To become a district attorney in San Francisco County, to become attorney general of California, United States senator, that's like running for president. My gosh, the, the state is so large and so diverse. She's got that ability. She brings a lot of energy to this ticket, and I think that that's key very much so. To what Ryan said as well, if you look at how she's polled in some of those battleground states, I mean, they dig her in Michigan and other places. She will definitely make a difference. She brings something else to it to answer the second part of your question. Beyond just the energy, she is able to engage and probably trounce Mike Pence in a debate or any other kind of engagement. She fills that role that we had talked about the last time that we were all on uh, of being that person who can be the attack dog, i.e. that person that can go out there on offense and defense for the campaign, for the ticket, where you, know, you can get away with a little bit more as a VP candidate than you can if you're the actual nominee for president. Uh, Ryan, if uh, if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are elected in November, what kind of vice president do you feel that she will be uh, in terms of serving the country? I think she'll be a great one. I mean, she has she has the experience, like Tony mentioned, from being a D.A. to being attorney general to being a U.S. senator and a presidential candidate. Um, and so I think she'll be a great one. I think um, what Joe will do or what President Biden at the time will do is is give her things just like. Barack gave to Joe things to do, right? And so vice president isn't really, you know, it depends on how the president wants to have their um, their administration look, but let's get, he'll give her things to do that she will lead on. She's not just there waiting for him to, to, to go away. Um, and so some of the, the issues that she finds um, important, she'll, she'll take a lead on. And Tony, I want to just follow up on something uh, Ryan just said about uh, bringing out the turnout. Uh, one of the issues that Hillary Clinton had last time around uh, was not being able to get the, uh, the black vote out that Barack Obama did when he was elected. Do you feel that with Kamala Harris on the ticket now, uh, there will be that huge turnout among uh, the black community that we saw when President Obama was elected? I do, because Obama will be campaigning for this ticket. Michelle Obama as well will campaign. Others key to that, that uh, uh, presidency will be out there. Certainly Kamala Harris can generate that vote. But you look at the other folks that have been supporting uh, Joe Biden. You know, this is very clear cut in the, the black community, the folks of color who are out there who are feeling so disenfranchised, so completely rolled over by this current administration. This isn't just about Biden Harris. This is almost survival. This is, uh, you know, you think of uh, Congressman Clyburn and others who had come out for, uh, for Biden early on. There's a support base there in communities of color to begin with. This is going to electrify it. And I think we're seeing that already. Uh, Brian, this obviously is an historic pick. Uh, Kamala Harris, the uh, uh, first black to be, uh, uh, you know, nominated on, the, on a national ticket like this. What is this going to mean for the, uh, the black community in general in terms of their enthusiasm and response? I think it's great. I think it's not only great for the black community, but she's also half Indian. 
Um, yeah. and, I'm bi- and I'm biracial myself. And so it's, it's great um, to see a biracial person um, at this level, especially a biracial woman. Um, and I, I do think it'll energize folks. And to Tony's point, you know, just having a black person on the ticket um, helps. But a lot of this is going to be a referendum on Donald Trump. Um, and so there is already an excitement not only to vote for Biden and vote for um, a Biden-Harris ticket, but there's an excitement to vote against Trump um, building up in these communities. I think the other thing that uh, Kamala brings to the table is what we talked about before, last episode as well, is suburban white mothers. Um, she connects with them. She does. Um, and so we'll see how um, white women in the suburbs respond to her being the pick. Uh, Tony, Joe Biden had a long list of potential vice presidential candidates he was sifting yeah. through. I think it was 11 that he really started with seriously, narrowed it down to a few, and then, of course, picked Kamala Harris. What do you think in the end was the t- determining factor there? I think the fact that she's already been tried in the fires of California campaigns, she's been out there on a presidential. Uh, and again, as I said, you really can't judge her by this last presidential. You've got to look at the other things she's been able to do. She's a fighter. I think more so than wanting that significant player in this campaign, he was thinking about something else. Joe Biden's not running again if he wins this time around. This is the ultimate interview, the greatest public interview for a job I think we're ever going to see. Ryan's right. Biden will look at this pick and do everything with her as Barack Obama did with him. This is the job interview that we're going to get to watch over the next four years. He's going to give her significant things to do, to try to go and get moving on the agenda that he's talking about that has to begin immediately after the election. And Ryan, do you feel this will focus uh, more attention now on the upcoming debates? Uh, There will be one with uh, Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, of course. Uh, How do you think she will fare in in that debate? I think everybody thinks that she's going to destroy Mike Pence. Um, And I don't want to make the expectations too high, but she, she does come from that prosecutorial background and that background is, is great to have on a debate stage. She's, she's spoken to juries. She's fought and argued, literally argued cases before. And so if she can prosecute the case against the Trump Pence administration, the way she's prosecuted cases as a DA and as an attorney general, she's going to be there. And we've seen, Uh, glimpses of that when she's a senator and she's questioning people who are in front of the Senate and how how um, intelligent and sharp she can be. Tony, as you know, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren was one of those uh, candidates that uh, Joe Biden was thinking about uh, when he was making his selection process for vice president. Uh, What do you feel the future is for Elizabeth Warren and potentially a cabinet position, uh, for example, in the Biden administration? Do you think that's something that uh, is a real possibility? A Biden-Harris White House could use Elizabeth Warren in the White House on the cabinet, but they would have to weigh out what the balance is in the United States Senate. You don't want to lose a significant voice in the United States Senate as a Democrat by moving her over to the cabinet. Certainly, in, 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 there would be a, a, a bit of doubt as to how she would be replaced. Charlie Baker, a Republican in Massachusetts, would be able to appoint someone to fill her seat. Would he, though he be a Republican? honor the will of the voters of Massachusetts and replace a Warren with a, with a Democrat. It's a lot of, a lot of variables to all of that that you've got to weigh out. But I do think that with an Elizabeth Warren, you've got someone who's going to have significant weight and sway with this White House. In addition, Warren and several others that have been vetted for uh, the vice presidency, Susan Rice, others, you've got potential nominees for the Supreme Court there. You know, it's, it's uh, very much in the minds of many people that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been in ill health that this is probably an opening that will occur in this next presidency. And uh, that's the unique thing of all these folks that he's looked at for vice president. He's already done the vetting, I would have to say, you know, relative to who might be a Supreme Judicial Court uh, nominee. And Ryan, how do you feel uh, this uh, presidential race is shaping up? Right now, Biden is ahead in the polls uh, over President Trump. Uh, We've still got three months before the election. Uh, But what kind of campaign do you feel this will be? And then... How do you feel uh, things will shape up as we get closer to Election Day? Well, as groundbreaking as the the pick of Kamala Harris is, it was still somewhat of a safe pick. And the Democrats are right now running a pretty safe race, which makes me a little nervous. But at the same time, um, Trump has been doing things to hurt himself anyways. And so as it shapes up, it, it seems like that's the trajectory. But Donald Trump is such an enigma. He is such a wild card something is going to happen to turn this race on its head at some point 
of his doing. Um, whether that will be helpful or hurtful for him, um, who knows, but I think the race is going to be significantly different over the next couple of months. And I'm guessing it's going to be because of something Trump does. And Tony, uh, there was another major political story this past week uh, on the local level in the race for first congressional district uh, between Richard Neal and Alex Morse. And that is uh, allegations surfaced of uh, Mayor Morse's relationship with college students, as reported by the Daily Collegian while he was an adjunct professor at UMass. Uh, how is this uh, revelation going to impact the Morse campaign and his chances, if you will, against Congressman Neal? Well, it's already impacted the campaign greatly in a lot of different ways. Those that we see on the surface, which are the obvious, that you've got several groups that had endorsed him, have been supporting him, that have decided to go on hold or suspend their campaign activity for uh, Mayor Morse. You've got others who have doubled down and are staying the course with him. This is an issue that will be important. It'll be on people's minds. It'll probably be there in the first debate, but there's way bigger issues that folks are concerned with right now. When we look at the polling of what's moving and motivating folks in the first congressional district, there's big issues out there. And sometimes, right, folks, you know, your eyes glaze over and you're starting to think about what are we gonna do to fight this pandemic? How are we gonna make an economic comeback, especially here in Western Massachusetts, where we never really made a comeback after the 2008 recession? Those big issues can be boring and onerous to a lot of folks. What we've seen in the last week, it's sensational. It's just a respite from the heavy stuff. But I think we're going to see is that a lot of folks will be basing their votes on what is it that you can do for me, Chairman Neal, Mayor Morse. How are you going to impact and affect my life and get things back on course? So I think that this is, you know, often we see it in politics. This is the more sensational, the more fun to watch, this back and forth that goes on right now. But there's way bigger issues. And I think that they'll probably start to return to that because those are the issues that I believe will more so move the needle for Neil or for Morse. And Ryan, we just wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, uh, Mayor Morse has responded rather strongly saying that uh, any relationship he has had has been a consensual one uh, and he's denied violating any UMass uh, rules on policy. Uh, but there is an issue here of the uh, power dynamic uh, in that someone in his position as a congressional candidate, as a mayor, as an adjunct professor, uh, reaching out to students. Uh, is this, do you feel, uh, wrong and inappropriate behavior uh, on Morse's behalf? I'd have to know more. Um, I really have to know more. And it, it's an interesting larger discussion on power dynamics, right? And so if Alex Morris is a guest lecturer, is that different than a professor? If he's a guest lecturer and it's uh, not a student that he has, but it happens to be one of the 22,000 students at UMass. Does that make a difference? If the student at UMass is 21 years old and not one of his students, does that make a difference? Um, and so where, where do folks have the, their own personal feelings on where a power dynamic corrupts a consensual sexual relationship? That's, that's a larger discussion. Um, and so the one things that, one of the things that kind of isn't great is that the, the investigation is supposedly going to be done after the election. I mean, it would be great if UMass could do the investigation quick enough so that the voters know in one way or the other and have, have a good feeling one or the one way or the other. I will say the fact that Alex didn't drop out um, kind of makes me feel that maybe at least he feels about what they could find isn't going to be terrible and that he's in it to fight. Um, you know, and, and so this, this debate coming up that you're going to moderate is going to be one, I think, that will have some fireworks. Tony, how do you feel about this power dynamic? Do you feel that what uh, Alex Morris did was inappropriate in terms of his position? Certainly, there's a, there's a question there that has to be answered. But as Ryan said, we really don't have a lot of information. We're now seeing the issue become very, very, very confused uh, it, with all the different back and forth that's occurring from different groups from the campaigns, from the PAC supporting one campaign or the other. So it would be grand if this investigation was done much sooner rather than later. So it's difficult to answer that, Ray. We don't have all the facts. We don't know for sure what the shake is. One thing I do know from polling though, if you look at the first congressional district, this is not an issue that is uh, of a nature that would be homophobic in some way that this would move votes overall. For a few, for a minor few, it would. But if you look at the numbers in this district in polling, and in votes passed, gay marriage, et cetera, uh, this is not a district that is going to weigh this on the fact that this is a uh, a person who is 
uh, of the LGBT community. That's not what the issue seems to be that we're seeing right now. It's more so the appropriateness or inappropriateness. As Ryan kind of well laid out there, that's more the issue. Uh, this is a district that has progressed a lot in its mindset and its thought. So I don't know how long this issue plays for or how significant it's going to be overall in moving the needle on essential votes. I think there's a lot of people in this district that are more worried about what does the future look like for their children, for themselves, for their businesses, for their employment. These heavier things, I think, is where we're going to see a return to that discussion or, or discourse or debate or battle between these two candidates. And Ryan, how do you feel that Alex Morris has handled these allegations and uh, conducted himself since uh, uh, this information uh, became public about a week ago? I've watched a couple of interview interviews and I think he's handled it well. Um, he's, he's, you know, just like I touched on, he's, he's, they're asking larger questions about a power dynamic. And, you know, he, there was, there was one issue where he thanked a college Democrat for, um, you know, being on a panel after and through social media. And maybe that was inappropriate. Um, and that person felt that what, what he was doing was, was wrong. And so he apologized. So, I think he's handled it well without at the same time delving into his own private life. You know, I work with a lot of elected officials, a lot of candidates running for office. They're human. They have private lives. They're, they deserve to have private lives. Um, and so, you know, his point about the fact that we're talking about his private sex life three weeks before the election was a good point for him to make. We should be talking about those issues that Tony raised earlier. Um, so I think he's done a pretty good job. I mean, the folks who weren't going to be with Alex are, this is going to be more fodder on not being with Alex. And the folks who are looking for a change are going to be with Alex almost, not no matter what, but this isn't going to be a thing to make or break. It's the people in the middle who are trying to figure out what's best for them that maybe this pulls them one way or the other. And uh, Tony, we're running short on time, but I wanted to get your quick thoughts on uh, one other race, of course, the kennedy Markey Senate race. Uh, and how you feel that is shaping up. Uh, that's, uh, you know, coming up in the primary, too, on September 1st. Uh, how do you handicap that race, and what do you see there? That one is an absolute neck-and-neck neck race right now. To Markey's credit, you can say that he began this race 22 to 24 points down in every poll that came out early on. He seems to have closed that gap, greatly so, obviously, to be neck-and-neck. Neck. But this is amazing. As you look at this now, as people are voting right now, getting their ballots back in the mail and whatnot. They're making up their minds now. And it's these ads, these messages from Joe Kennedy or from Markey or the PACs against each other one that could be motivating and moving those votes. This is a dogfight right down to the end, right? And quickly too, this one has some implications, I think, on Morse Neal as well. There are parallels, you know, the older tried true champion, so to speak, who's been in the job versus the, the, the challenger, you know, the, the energetic or younger challenger, et cetera. You know, you've got to make the case when you're the incumbent, Marky or Neil, for what you've done. I think both of them are doing that pretty well. That may be the reason that Marky's been able to close the gap. But gosh, what's great about this is that this is interesting for the average regular person. You don't want runaway elections. You want elections that are tight.